This is Deselany, and welcome to episode 10 of 90s Overlooked Underhood. So I'm kind of setting the scene for the next two videos with this introduction because um, this video and the next one um, cover major label debuts from two bands who were hailing from San Francisco. Um, they were both signed in that kind of post Nirvana kind of major label feeding frenzy when um, major labels were kind of fishing in the alternative underground indie cult kind of music scene. Uh, looking for the next big thing. But I feel both the bands that I'm going to talk about um, are worlds apart and neither could ever be construed as grunge. As I say, both bands were um, long-time uh, residents and had a long-term association with San Francisco. Um, specifically, um, both were kind of very strongly associated with the Tenderloin district of San Francisco, where they um, either lived or recorded or rehearsed um, a lot. Um, and the Tenderloin is this kind of quite uh, run down, quite violent, quite druggy <laughs> region of San Francisco. Both bands also had quite significant cult followings outside the USA, um, specifically being quite big in Europe. Um, they certainly could uh, tour Europe um, quite happily and uh, fill venues. Both bands were fronted by charismatic singer-songwriters, but charismatic in completely, completely different ways. So the uh, album I'd like to talk about today is Mercury by American Music Club released in March of 1993. As I said, this was their major label debut. But the band had been around since around about 1983 and had released uh, a string of independent albums, which had built them quite a serious following. Um, the songwriter and leader of the band is Mark Eitzel. And uh, the other two longtime members of the band that were kind of with him all the way for the entire journey were Voodie, their guitarist Voodie, and uh, bass player Dan Pearson. Uh, Mercury is the band's sixth um, album. I think it's probably fair to say that most of their fans or the majority of American Music Club's fan base would, would consider Everclear the album preceding this um, from 1991 to be their kind of high point. Um, and there are also lots of fans of the earlier albums, particularly uh, the California and United Kingdom albums. For a major label debut, um, it's odd. To start with, let's just talk about American Music Club sound. So they're very rooted in this kind of folky singer-songwriter tradition. Uh, Mark Hartzell has uh, gone on record as quoting some of his influences as being people like uh, Joni Mitchell, people like Nick Drake or Leonard Cohen, or uh, even John Armour Trading, I believe he's mentioned a few times. I also hear elements of like a kind of a toned down Tom Waits, possibly. Yeah, Tom Waits without that kind of... Um, overwhelming sense of kind of uh, theatricality and that he's inhabiting characters. And um, I think you also hear a lot of the the kind of that songwriting prowess of mid to late period kind of Elvis Costello in some of our Eitzel's work. But the actual band, they provide this kind of this rich kind of uh, very supple kind of folk rock backing to Eitzel's music. Um, which is kind of filled out by this very impressionistic free guitar playing of, of Voodie. They allowed him to kind of create these soundscapes. He's a very textural kind of guitarist. They also featured um, Bruce Kafen on pedal steel guitar, 
which again just gives it this yearning kind of countryish feel. He's an amazing pedal steel player um, and adds a lot of atmosphere to their music with this. They were kind of chameleon-like in that they could kind of take on a jazzier air or they could take on a country air or they could just kind of go straight out kind of, you know, barroom punk rock. Or they could, in fact, just strip things back to the bone and leave kind of Mark Eitzel almost as a solo performer, kind of with just this acoustic backing of his own. I mean, I think the band itself, just an incredible foil to, to Mark Eitzel's songwriting. I think their problem was that their major label debut, it's quite a heavy listen. And I think to go from Everclear in 91 where everyone was kind of holding their breath, waiting for American Music Club to make this big leap to Mercury. It just didn't happen. It's extremely dark. It's extremely depressing. It's about grief. It's about loss. It's about death. It's about breakups. There's very little light in the album. I think the other reason why uh, Mercury isn't maybe quite so appreciated by fans of the band is that it's definitely their most produced album um, to this point. Uh, it was produced by Mitchell Froome, who um, had worked on albums by people like Crowded House and Suzanne Vega. And um, I'm of completely the opposite view. I, I, I think the extra depth and the richness and the kind of the variation that's on this album is just what such a dark record needs. And I don't find them ever getting in the way. I don't find the production tricks. I don't find the instrumentation ever getting in the way of Eitzel's songwriting at all or the band's performances. Um, in fact, I, I think this might be the strongest set of songs Eitzel ever committed um, as a single album. And his lyrics, they are as ever just raw, just blisteringly confessional, emotional. By turns, he could be really darkly funny, but also just self-hating and bitter and pointed. He left nothing off the table. He put everything out there. So Mercury... Let's talk about some tracks. Gratitude Walks is a, a great scene setter and a great album opener. It's kind of this sad, smoky, jazzy number. Um, it has a kind of a, a muted kind of, you know, Frank Sinatra type feel. Because Eitzel was never scared to kind of uh, adopt a kind of almost a, a kind of a crooner type um, persona to get some of his music across. And I think you hear a lot of that on this album and a lot of that, especially on this opening track. Um, but it also kind of, this song showcases Eitzel's problem. Um, he, he sings the line, drunk on the kind of applause that gets louder the lower you sink. And this was his dilemma. I think Eitzel felt like he kind of almost painted himself into a corner where the only way he could get people to love his music more was to pour more and more of himself out, open more and more of himself up. And um, I think on this album, it, it does lead to great music, but I think this was also possibly the turning point in Eitzel's songwriting where he kind of found he had to start keeping a little bit back. Just really kind of a spellbinding kind of performer, but but ultimately quite a self-destructive one. And I think some of this was to do with his, his long uh, recognised issues with alcohol. Um, the track Challenger kind of hints at this, and it's the oddest track on the album, probably, in terms of uh, it's very uncharacteristic. It's very driving and dizzying and, uh, and chaotic. But it does touch on these alcohol issues. It kind of imagines Mark being 
in a plane and asking the stewardess to fix him up a drink of mercury, whilst at the same time the plane goes down in a flaming wreck, killing everyone on board it. It's kind of encapsulating the whole idea of alcohol as this fuel for destruction. Yeah, it's a very chaotic, quick song, but I I think he reveals quite a lot of himself in it. Um, A track like I've Been a Mess, he details the the result of a, a failed, a broken relationship. And he likens it to how Lazarus might have felt if he was raised from the dead, only to say, oh God, not again. It's this idea that even when you you break up with someone, there's every chance you're still going to have to face them. And this song kind of tries to frame that feeling. I mean, uh, just for some lyrics, he sings, your beauty is just a slap in the face that's going to bring me back to life, back to another sky that's blue, that's going to turn me into another great American zombie. So hungry, so hungry for you. And it's just emotionally devastating. But man, I mean, what a what a metaphor! What a what a way to introduce that idea. It's an amazing song, and he covers very similar ground later on the album with what I think is the best track on this record, and it may well be the best song that Mark Eitzel has ever written, and that is "Apology for an Accident." And again, it's another song about a breakup, the the fallout of a breakup, and these encounters with people who you've shared your soul with, and how you deal with that. And um, by turns, uh, it's the song is self pitying and maudlin, and then it turns, and it becomes something bitter and pointy and angry. He sings, well, I'm an expert in all things that nature abhors, the look of disgust when I touch your skin, and I try and figure out what the world needs me for, and I replay the scene again and again, and I can see you try and put me in my place. But honey, that's a little weak for my taste. So yeah, it, it switches from this kind of terrible sadness to this anger in the space of a verse or a chorus. Um, Absolutely fearless songwriting. I mean, you can see why Mark Leitzel is revered amongst his fellow songwriters as just being uh, one of the best. The album isn't just about losing partners or lovers in in the sense of a relationship. But there's also a strong feeling of the loss of friends, possibly partners, to AIDS. I mean, the the horrific effects of the HIV AIDS kind of uh, epidemic of the late 80s and early 90s amongst the gay community that Mark was a part of. Um, yeah, it just casts a very long shadow on some of the songs here but maybe in different ways than you might expect. Um, what at first seems to be kind of the single, the jolly, the upbeat, the one that's meant to pull people in, the song Johnny Mathis's Feet, whilst it's very light and funny, and I'll talk about that in a moment, um, Mark tells us that he was actually uh, inspired to write this as a funny song for someone he knew who was dying of AIDS and just kind of needed cheering up. So he kind of sends himself up in this song as a way of kind of giving this person a a gift at a time when they needed it most. But the song itself kind of pictures, uh, pictures Mark meeting Johnny Mathis, this kind of lounge crooner and saying, you know, what about my songs? What, What do you think about this? Where am I going wrong? And then in the song, Johnny Mathis picks apart 
exactly why Mark is going about things the wrong way, why his songs will never amount to anything much, and how wrong he's got everything. It is pretty funny. It's a pretty funny song. The one piece of advice that Johnny Mathis gives him that that kind of um, the song hinges on, the big kind of string swelling chorus hinges on, Johnny tells him that he has to learn how to disappear in the spotlight. And I think this is Mark kind of acknowledging to himself that he cannot carry on the way he is. He cannot carry on just spilling everything on stage, spilling everything on record. And then he has to learn how to kind of to disappear, to pull back, to not give away everything of himself. Yeah, Johnny Mathis's feet is probably about uh, as light and funny as um, Mark Eitzel could really get. I think the real song on this album, which which deals with the AIDS crisis in a very personal way and in a much more head-on way is the track The Hopes and Dreams of Heaven's 10,000 Whores. The verses feature this kind of very slow, kind of doomy, portentous climbing chord sequence outlining all these kind of very humdrum but horrible realities that someone facing AIDS knowing that they will ultimately die it kind of addresses these things head on and also touches on the people who maybe are around who don't want to acknowledge that because it's just too difficult too painful just to quote some lyrics again he sings believe me if you can said the pile of bones i think that this is all there is left to see just waiting for my prescription to come because every sec in hell dissolves more of me and then the chorus changes it has this tinkly kind of descending almost kind of joyous release but the lyrics again are very pointy he sings and all of heaven's ten thousand whores are on a party line to his big toe saying "Ooh, i just can't do it anymore so don't bother asking now you know it's almost as if these people can't face being around this person's pain and this person's suffering and they'd rather not be there and the kind of the, the kind of the tinkling kind of watery descent of the chorus brings you back down to earth and grounds the song again it's almost kind of playful it's it's a very very dark song and it's very very beautiful um and to be able to kind of capture that much in a single song well i i think it shows how when mark wants to be he can be very sure-footed and very precise in the way he composes his music but the album ends with kind of there's a there's a pinprick of light at the end of this very dark tunnel that is mercury and that's with the closing song will you find me and I, this is the one that is probably the most stripped down kind of mark eitzel solo acoustic type song um and in it he's he's bearing his soul again um saying how much he wants to hide away from life and how difficult everything is couching it in all this strange imagery of uh, of people dressing as astronauts at halloween and uh, it's very odd and then comes the chorus and in the chorus, he just sings the line, but will you find me? And the strings swell to the foreground. And Bruce Caffin's kind of underwater pedal steel kind of swells in. And suddenly Mark's voice, the song, isn't as lonely and as skeletal as it was. And you get this sense of calm that Mark isn't alone, but he's asking for help that he wants someone to find him um 
It's like the music is responding to the question he's saying, will you find me? And it's soothing him. It's responding. Um, it's a lovely, lovely song. Again, this is an album that, that divides American music club fans. Um, there are a lot who very much appreciate the songs, but think it's overproduced. I think the instrumentation and the songs and the feel of the album, the pacing of the album, the sequencing of the album is just spot on. I just think as a listening experience from start to finish, it's an amazing, amazing record. The usual suggestions are, are down there below me. So um, uh, dig in if you feel like doing any of those things. And in the meantime, thanks for watching. Please join me again next time for another episode of 90s Overlooked Underhood.